I'm Michael Wesch. I'm an associate professor of cultural anthropology at Kansas State University. And, you know, anthropology is a study of all humans in all times and all places. And I've kind of ran the gamut of that. I've done some research in Papua New Guinea uh, off and on for about eight years studying how new media affects their society. But new media for them is, you know, it's not like cell phones and 3G and internet access and all that stuff. It's writing. So I looked at how writing affects their culture. And then by extension, it inspired me to think about how new media might be affecting our culture. You know, when we started, I expected to find out that they're immersed in a digital world, and of course they are. Um, but in a way, that's kind of passe to them. It's so, they're so immersed that it's almost invisible. What was more interesting about that was when I started asking them about how they learn and I realized that they associate learning with acquiring information and that's it. Like there's no deeper understanding of what learning might be about. And obviously the, the message of the room is sending that message, right? It's me at the front of the room delivering a lecture and they're supposed to dutifully write everything down and then regurgitate it on an exam and that's learning. We got into a deep discussion about learning as transformation. Like what if you thought of learning as a point at which you actually uh, changed something about yourself and, and really grew as a person. And then they started to realize, well, you know, that, that happens mostly because they're in pursuit of these big questions. And the three big questions that they're all in pursuit of are, who am I? What am I going to do? And am I going to make it? And these are three questions that throughout most of human history, nobody's really had to ask, but now everybody has to ask them because you have to figure out who you're going to be. There's all sorts of questions about, you know, what your identity is going to be, what you're going to believe, what you're going to value. These are all very complicated questions in today's world. And then the second thing, what am I going to do? Like, what, what's your career path going to be in a world in which there are infinite career paths and many of the careers that you might be preparing for don't exist yet? And then that leads to this other question, am I going to make it? Which, you know, there's a lot of, I think students are very concerned about this. Uh, there's also three sort of sister questions that emerge, and that is that you, we also have to realize that the world is, because it's changing so quickly and because things are so, uh, there are, are so many challenges in today's world, everything from, say, environment and energy issues to other issues revolving around poverty, inequality, and so on. There's this other set of questions, which is, who are we? What are we going to do? Are we going to make it? And students, I think, more and more are engaged in those questions as well. The tragedy of our times is that our schools are not necessarily speaking to those questions. These questions are burning in their souls, and yet we're not speaking to them. We're just, you know, regurgitating what we learned that we're supposed to teach them from our discipline. And in the meanwhile, not really engaging them on these really deep questions that are so important to them. And I realized I had to shift from being a good teacher to creating a good learning environment where people were actually learning. So it wasn't about my teaching anymore, it's about their learning. What you have at a Christian institution is you have the, the possibility of framing education with a grander purpose in mind, with the purpose of growing the whole individual, not just about learning little bits and little facts, but actually transforming the person, growing the person in all aspects of their lives, body, mind, and spirit. And I think that's the real advantage you have at a Christian institution, and, and it should be uh, embraced and leveraged. So I think the, f the first thing to recognize is that they're preparing for a world of change, and maybe change is the very thing that they're preparing for. It's, you know, it reminds me of uh, Alvin Toffler wrote 40 years ago about this idea of future shock. And, that it, that it, and what he said in that moment was that change has changed, which is to say that change happens so quickly that you expect it you know, in dramatic ways every couple of years. I mean, so, so you're talking about no matter what career path you're on, you're going to have to reinvent yourself all along that journey. It, you know, you're not going to prepare for being 25 and then you're just going to do the same thing for 40 years and retire. It's so, so that requires a tremendous amount of flexibility and adaptability. And I should mention that there's also a slew of 
ethical questions that are going to emerge because of technology. It's already starting to emerge in, say, in genetics and cloning and all those types of things. Those are obvious. Uh, in the world that I study in digital technology, um, we have these emerging challenges that have to do with just how smart computers are starting to appear to be. So, for example, um, this, this guy went into Target in Minneapolis recently and he was furious and he had this, um, he had this little coupon book and it was sent to his 15-year-old daughter and he, he's furious because it was full of advertisements for uh, diapers and for like, you know, baby stuff. And he's like, what are you doing sending this to my 15-year-old daughter? And they're all very apologetic, you know. Well, two, two days later, he calls them back apologizing and says, well, it turns out there were things going on in my house that I didn't know about. So Target actually knew that she was pregnant before he did. And they knew it not because there was, you know, some easy flag to recognize, like she brought, you know, she bought prenatal vitamins. It wasn't that. It was that she bought unscented lotion and a bunch of new washcloths. And that gave a 70% chance that she was pregnant. What that points out is that there is this huge database of information about us that's being created through our digital transactions, which raises all kinds of issues about ethics and privacy and so on. But even more interesting than that is how sophisticated that the analysis is becoming, these algorithms that are churning on this data to make essentially decisions that look very smart. And in fact, uh, you could say that in many ways they know us better than we know ourselves, right? And you think about all the information Facebook has or anything like that. Now, let me take it one step further because I'm, you know, algorithms are especially interesting in this regard. We now have algorithms that pick most of the movies that are made based on a calculation of how much they're going to make. Um, we have algorithms that, of course, choose the movies that you're going to watch. About 60% of the movies that we watch on Netflix are chosen for us by Netflix. Um, these are very powerful. Even more powerful algorithms though, are actually creating music and uh, newspaper articles. And uh, Most of the articles you read on uh, Saturday or Sunday f f about sports are actually written by computers that are just taking the box score and generating this story. Some people looking at the future of this thing say that within five years a computer might actually win the Pulitzer Prize. So these are like really dramatic shifts in our relationship to technology that will ultimately test our sense of ourselves. Like where is the boundary between me and this augmented intelligence that I'm leveraging, maybe through my Google goggles, you know, that, or maybe I'll actually have something embedded in, you know, in my visual cortex. You know, when you have instant access to information anytime, anywhere, that really starts to lead to bigger questions about who we are and our relationship to technology. These are some of the big philosophical questions our youth will have to address, and it will affect, of course, their career choices and the types of careers that are available. Um, and so I think, again, it comes back to that, that sense that you need to teach the whole person. You need to help them embrace the questions that are sort of burning in their soul and, and let them, I think one of the most important things we can do is actually teach or help students sit with questions and let them be a sort of force that, that guides them and moves them forward as they explore the world. You know, if you think about what, where learning starts, it almost always starts with a question. You can't just tell somebody something and expect them to absorb it. But if they have a burning question and you are there with some guidance, then, then it works. So I think if you think about a question, um, it really is the, the heart of learning and we should be uh, helping our students embrace those questions. So digital ethnography is two things. On the one hand, it's the study of digital cultures and digital worlds and how the digital, how digital technology affects culture. On the other hand, it's also the use of digital technology to portray the insights from this kind of study. So on the one hand, we're studying how the digital affects culture, and on the other hand, we're also trying to harness and leverage digital technology to actually display our results in some meaningful way. You know, ethnography is literally the graphing of an ethnos, right, of, of a culture. So you're graphing a culture. 
But of course, you never get it exactly right because there are a million different ways to describe a culture. So instead of being, a, it's not about being right like a normal science. Instead, it's about depth and insight. It's about, and more than that, I think it's not just about insight, but it's about revelation. It's about bringing insights to the people uh, by revealing them in some new way that maybe they hadn't thought about it before. So, so that's the kind of thing that we try to do. So I can give a couple examples. Um, one would be like there's this great idea uh, called ambient intimacy. So this is a, a word, a, a term that gives us insight into how students might be connecting on Twitter or Facebook and that kind of thing. Like a lot of people wonder, like why is it that students will tweet about brushing their teeth or <laughs> you know, all these little like tidbits of their lives, like why would they do that? And there's a term that we've developed called ambient intimacy, which gives us some insight. Uh, it allows us to see it in a new way. And, and the idea would be that, well, it gives them a sense of being connected through these tiny little things. And the fact that they knew when you brushed your teeth just gives them a sense of like, it's nice to know what you're doing right now. I, I feel this sense of connection with you. So a lot of students are doing that. Now we'll get into maybe a little bit later whether that's good or bad, but it at least gives us some insight in what's going on. Another idea is, uh, we use a phrase called connection without constraint, which is to say that in the digital world, there are fewer constraints for connecting. I mean, this, this is obvious in the one sense, you can connect with anybody, anytime, anywhere. But constraint also has another meaning to it that reveals something here, and that is that you can also, you don't have the constraints of, uh, of being in the same place with them, so you can turn them off at any time. So you can connect with anybody, anytime, anywhere, but you can also turn it off anytime. And that means that there's sort of a double-sidedness to it. On the one hand, there's this sense of connection that you can just open up and be connected. But on the other hand, what's the strength of that connection? Is it, we often talk about uh, online, we see a lot of deep but loose connections, which is to say, you will find people actually revealing things about themselves that they don't reveal even to their closest friends because they, they have a sense of anonymity. They have a sense that they can maybe be a little bit more risky in, in how they reveal things. And at the same time, we also don't see people always taking the same responsibilities they would take with a face-to-face -face relationship. So one of the things that can be revealed through digital ethnography is just that, that relationships are changing and that uh, we should be aware of how they're changing. And back to the students again, I think it's really important that our students understand how what kinds of relationships they're building uh, through digital technologies and, and whether or not they are uh, worthwhile and productive and, and uh, real, for lack of a better word. <laughs>
with digital technology. They are not so good at educating themselves with digital technology. And that's where I think uh, our insight as digital immigrants <laughs> becomes very important. Um, the fact that we have sat with uh, books and wrestled with books and all those types of things with, without Google to turn to and give us the quick and easy answer gives us some insight into the value of that process. And in some ways we need to bring that value to the digital native. So I think there's a lot to be learned from both sides. And, uh, and I think it's important to, to not simply look at digital natives as well. They totally get technology. Because what you'll find is when you start pushing them to really learn with technology or to collaborate with technology, um, you'll find that they're, they're not so skilled at it. And just as an example, they may be very good at Twitter and Facebook and so on. Uh, they will not be very good at editing Wikipedia. They'll be good at looking at Wikipedia, but most likely they've never edited Wikipedia. And that's a, a leap that I think is important to make and we need to help them make it. There's a really, I think, a, a very telling story about this. And this is uh, Seymour Papert went to, uh, this is 20 years ago, Seymour Papert, this brilliant MIT professor, he goes to this preschool to look at how young children learn. And he, during this time, there's a, uh, a four-year-old ask him how, how giraffes sleep. So he grew up in Africa and they thought, well, maybe he would know how giraffes sleep. And, but he didn't know. And so all these theories started bubbling up and nobody knew the answer. So then later that day he goes home and he has this wall of encyclopedias. So he pulls down his encyclopedias and he tries to find out how giraffes sleep. Well, he still can't find out. So his books, even his great wall of books was not up to the task. But he sat there pondering the question that night. And this was 20 years ago, like before the World Wide Web had really blossomed and all that. And he realized, you know, someday these kids will be able to find the answer themselves and they'll do it with simple gestures, like little hand gestures and all those kind of things. He was essentially envisioning a World Wide Web combined with, you know, tablets, you know, iPads and so on. I mean, he had the whole vision right there. And he called this thing the knowledge machine. He said that this will change education dramatically because you'll have all the knowledge in the world at your fingertips, literally at your fingertips. And he was right. You know, if you look up giraffes today on YouTube, for example, and I can do it on my phone right now, I'll get 56,000 videos. I'll get, uh, I can look to Google Scholar and I'll get hundreds of articles, very detailed articles about how they sleep. And then I can look to Google Images and get all the images of that, right? So now we know, it's very easy to know these kinds of things. Uh, however, if you don't have an interesting question, if you don't have curiosity, if you don't have uh, the courage to sit with a question, all these, like this capacity and desire to learn, then this knowledge machine becomes a distraction device. And I think that more than anything is sort of emblematic of what we should be doing in higher ed right now. Like we should be, we should realize that the knowledge machine is here, that the stuff of knowledge is all around us, but that doesn't mean that people are good learners. And it doesn't mean that people are naturally going to gravitate towards learning within this environment. So it becomes a, a task for us I often use the phrase to move our students from being knowledgeable, knowing a bunch of stuff, to also being knowledge able, like able to harvest all of the knowledge around them, to analyze it, criticize it, um, and, and make use of it in some way. Just to elaborate a little bit on that idea, so when I was in Papua New Guinea and doing several years of research there, that's where I really realized the influence of media. And I think it's interesting that I would realize the influence of media in a place where there is no media. You know, I mean, there was, when I first arrived, there was no media at all. There was no writing. There was, you know, no, no electricity, no, um, no 3G access, none of that. And what I realized, because being in a very foreign land is like being a child again, here I am growing up sort of all over again, having a second childhood in New Guinea, but it's not mediated. And I started to realize how powerful media was in my first childhood. And for my first childhood, it was mostly television and then towards the latter years, you know, the internet. But um, I was surprised at how different it was to grow up in a place where your entire self and identity was shaped through face-to-face -face relationships. So I started studying that. That became what I wanted to study. And no sooner did I start studying that, that writing came in. And writing came in 
uh, through a government initiative to bring in a census and law and these types of things. And it, it was surprising to me to see, say the census, for example, how, how that immediately started to change things so that when they went into a village and they wanted to take down people's names, the first thing, the first struggle was they realized that many of the people in the village didn't have names. And they didn't have names because everybody they ever saw, they already knew, and they had a relationship name for that person, not a categorical name. So they didn't have like a personal name like, you know, Jeff or John. It was brother or father or friend or trading partner or any number of other words that designate a relationship rather than a, than a name. So they had to invent names, which they called census names. So they were already starting to change. And that, that just gives you a little sense of when you, when you bring a new technology into a society, it doesn't just, it's not just a technological change, it's a social change. It changes how we connect to each other. Every, every communications medium shapes what can be said, how it can be said, who says it, who can hear it, how those messages will be accessed in the future or if they can be accessed in the future. So there's all these, it's a reconfiguration of time and space of your community and those relationships. So uh, new technology equals new relationships and that uh, has really profound consequences. So now on to students, I think the most obvious and profound change in today's world is just the, the fact that there is now ubiquitous information about anything, anywhere, on all kinds of devices available. And, you know, through, that most of them will have two or three devices on them at any time that they can access that information. Now, what, is, what does that mean for teaching? Well, it means that it might not be the best use of class time to ask them to regurgitate information that they can just look up on their phone. It's time instead to press the envelope a little bit get them thinking critically, get them, and not just critically, I think we have to take it even a step further beyond thinking critically to have them thinking creatively. Uh, I think that the ultimate goal of them, of preparing them to live in this digital world is to make them fully literate. And when we talked about being literate in the print age, that meant reading and writing. And we have to use the same rubric in today's digital age. They need to be able to read the digital which is to say, you know, analyze it and criticize it and all that kind of thing. But they also need to be able to write in this digital age. And that means being fluent in multiple media forms, not just in writing, but also in video and, and audio production. And being able to make a profound statement through th that media. We've seen in our own studies, we've seen young people literally change the world through using these new media technologies. They go out and they They've created, I've seen Sean Ahmed, for example, a student at Notre Dame, go out and create a totally new form of NGO, you might say, or charity organization uh, that is battling hunger in Bangladesh. And he does it through Twitter, YouTube, and Facebook. And it's a brilliant organization completely ran by this one guy, you know. Um, and, be, and he could do it because he's fluent in these different media forms. And I, I just feel that... It's so important to have all of our students fluent in these media forms. So let me start with a baseline comparison, and that would be some experience I had in New Guinea during this time in which they, did, they had no media. And so when I first got there, I was actually really sort of, I was actually very, very sad <laughs> because, I mean, I was going through a lot of, of it was very hard to enter like a new world and, and have, I mean, this is very isolated. There's no way in or out of this place. So I can't just like pick up the phone and talk to somebody. I'm immersed in a foreign culture. And in this culture, nobody knows who I am or why I'm there, or what I'm doing. And what I realized was that when, when everybody around you doesn't know why you're there or who you are, or what you're doing, you start asking the same questions. <laughs> and so I'm trying to figure out who I am and what I'm doing here. And it sounds kind of funny, but I was deeply sad, so deeply sad that I had this moment walking along this ridge where I started to feel weak and I just collapsed on the side of this ridge and I was crying. And these two guys were walking behind me and, and as they got to me, by the time they got to me, they were crying too. And it was like this amazing moment, like 
these the empathy that they showed at that moment and uh and i never forgot that and as i lived there i started to realize just how powerful and pervasive this empathy was between people not just with me and them but um, among themselves as well so then you look at the last well i mean you can look at like recent research on college students for example which shows that empathy is on the decline in our society and this is important because Empathy is the capacity to imagine your way into somebody else's perspective, which is probably one of the most important skills you can imagine in today's world, just in sense of like connecting with others and that kind of thing. So that's on the decline among college students. And you look at, well, what, what could cause that? And you could say, well, you look at New Guinea and you could say, well, why, is it, why are they so connected? And you could say, well, they, they share their lives together. There's, it's unmediated. There's no technology distracting them. Everything is shared. And I would go a step further and say, it's not just that they share their lives. They also, they also share, I mean, they share their deaths as well. They share everything. There's no mediating death either. So I actually sat with many people and watched them die, like friends of ours. And it's in those moments that you get a sense of deep connection to our shared human experience, that we're all vulnerable, that we're all fragile, and that from that is born this sense of empathy and connection with one another. And in our society, we've used technology for the last hundred years. It's not just the new stuff. It's also, it starts really, you know, with any transportation or communications technology, we've used all those technologies to actually separate ourselves, to put ourselves into boxes. Every one of those technologies, if you, you could start with the car, for example, it, it allows us to possibly connect with more people, to go further than we've ever gone before, to open ourselves up to others in ways we, and explore the world in ways we've never explored it. But the reality is that we've used the car to build suburbia, to build cities in which we live in boxes and then we shop in boxes where we don't know the people inside who are selling us the stuff. And then we look through other boxes, the television, to connect back to our culture. And then over time, we've just you know, separated in more and more boxes, shopped in bigger boxes, and now we, you know, look through other boxes, right, <laughs> like these. And all the while, we're actually cutting ourselves off from each other. And this has really dramatic effects. So if you look at how our kids are raised now, we, they are raised in a culture of fear and suspicion. So uh, I was just reading a story about Peter White, who grew up in the 1950s, and he, he talks about how in the 1950s, he was allowed to explore all over his neighborhood unsupervised. And then he got to be, uh, he got into his uh, later sort of tweens, I guess, and he learned to ride a bike and, and he could go a little further. And then he got into his teenage years and he started hitchhiking and he would hitchhike up to 100 miles and be back by night. And Peter White did all of this in the 1950s, but the punchline is that Peter White is blind. And then you go back and you think about all these things that he did. His parents allowed him to explore the neighborhood unsupervised. He you know, learned to ride a bike and he had the scars to prove it that he was going to do it, you know. And then he hitchhiked, which is to say he put his faith in strangers that he couldn't see, knowing that he was going to get back by that night. That is a level of public trust that we just don't have today. And I think it's indicative of the type of boxes that we put ourselves in. And the ultimate outcome of this is that our kids are not as apt in opening themselves up and exploring the world as they might need to be. And I think it's uh, one of the things we need to do is we need to um, reconnect them with their sense of, uh, with the courage to face these common human vulnerabilities through which we build real connections and also gain that courage to explore the world. So for a school like Biola, it, I think, again, you have like this great advantage of actually being able to address this issue directly. Um, I think there's an expectation in a secular institution that learning is sort of an instrument toward another end. But at, a, at an institution like Biola, you have the opportunity to frame education as growth of the whole individual, not just of the whole individual, but also of a community. And you can model at Biola the type of community that you want them to go out and create in the world. And that's essentially what we're talking about here. I mean, if you talk about what gives students 
the courage and capacity to connect deeply with others and to open themselves up to new ideas and uh, new connections? The answer is a good community. And what you can do at Biola is model that good community and also inspire them to start creating that community beyond Biola as well. I think there are many ways that you can do little things to integrate technologies that are pertinent to students. And one of the things, the first things to do is just to ask your students what technologies they're using, which ones they'd be comfortable bringing into the classroom. It changes every year. I mean, it changes every semester. So, you know, what that technology will be will always be different. But the key is you want to think about what that technology can actually do. It's not necessarily what it was designed for. Because, you know, Twitter might not have been designed for the classroom, but it can still be useful to augment the classroom experience in different ways. So, so that's step one, is just getting to know what your students are using and how you might leverage it in the classroom. But I think the, the bigger picture here is just to simply be aware that, that technology really does provide the full learning environment. When you walk into a classroom, it's not just a bunch of chairs and some walls. Not anymore. I mean, now, floating in the air all around us are all these other tools, and, other, and not to mention all this information. And that should and, uh, change the way that we approach it. Even if you're not going to use the tools, we should be aware that they're there. Um, so there, there are a few things I want to mention about this. On the one hand, I think the fact that we live in an age of ubiquitous information about anything, anywhere, that comes on all kinds of devices uh, indicates first that it's not enough just to know a bunch of stuff. You also have to be able to harness and leverage the tools at hand to actually interact with this environment of information. Secondly, then, that if you want to make students more knowledge able, that is able to actually harness and leverage this information, um, the best way to do that is to give them practice. It's not to create artificial tasks that they know are artificial and sort of make them drone on and do this Google search and that kind of thing. It's more like create real and relevant projects, get them excited about this, and they will naturally engage in this environment. And you need to be the guide on the side that sort of helps them uh, navigate this and, and find new ways to navigate it. And I think the third element here that is often overlooked is then that we also, in terms of like, creating total media literacy. It's not just about how to harness and leverage these tools, but also they need to be aware of and able to know when to put these tools away. They need to know when it's time to sit with a question, to ponder something, to contemplate something. And pondering and contemplation don't go well with the screen. They just don't. <laughs> so it's probably a good time to give them the, the capacity to be able to turn it all off. And I can imagine, you know, and so there's probably people watching this right now. Um, I, I think if you're totally honest with yourself about this question about how to use technology and you come to the conclusion that it's not right for my class because my class is about contemplation and, and dealing with very deep questions, you might be right that technology isn't right for you. Um, however, it does have a place in the total curriculum. We can't send our students off without this knowledge ability within this new world. But that isn't to say that every class is going to have to have, you know, technology immersion. There is a place for contemplation, and oftentimes that will be screen-free. I, I think it would be important to address um, faculty use of technologies in their own lives, right? And I think it's important for faculty to really try to harness and leverage new technologies to help them in their own research and in their own um, understanding of the world and their own pursuit of knowledge. And if you yourself are using these tools in a productive way to pursue knowledge, then you'll be better uh, suited to help your students do the same thing. And one of the most important things we can do is simply 
to model good learning. And it may be the only thing we can do. In fact, when you look at uh, the evidence of teaching and learning and what works, the most effective things are just simply modeling. You simply model. If you model the capacity to sit with a question, to ask yourself questions, if you model the capacity to uh, embrace failure and move on, these are the, it's only through those things that, that students can actually grab onto it. You can't just tell them, you know, you should ask good questions. <laughs> you can't just tell them you should embrace failure. You actually have to at least model it, uh, if not sort of be there with them and help them through those moments. There are really two parts to this. I think number one is, uh, and it's going to be kind of a surprising answer because it's not like a formula, it's more like a, a meditation. <laughs> and I'd say the first step is to familiarize yourself with the tools as well as you can and just to know what's out there. And once you know what's out there, one of the things you'll realize is that if you can imagine it, it probably exists. And so if you can imagine a tool that would be useful, it probably exists and you just have to find it. And uh, I'll mention, for example, uh, if you're struggling to find the tools, there are people like Larry Ferlazzo who has a, a blog that keeps track of all the tools. He publishes like the 100 best tools of 2012 and, and he does this on a regular basis. So, so you can always have access to lots and lots of possibilities of what could be used in the classroom. Um, but then the, the next piece though, and this is where it sounds much less like, you know, advice and more like a, I don't know, it's more like a call to meditate. But I think the best way to move forward is to practice loving your students. And I think of love here in the terms of Eric Fromm's The Art of Loving, which I think is actually the best teaching book ever, even though it's not a teaching book <clears throat> and it was written over 50 years ago. It may be the best teaching book ever because what it says in the opening parts of that book are one is that love is not an experience that you just wait for. It's something that you do. It's a capacity that you develop and that there are four pillars of this capacity. You have to care, which is obvious, um, but that's not enough. If you just care for your students, then it can come off as sort of oh, a little bit paternal and patronizing. It's like you know, it's, it's not, there's nothing to it, really. I mean, yeah, you care about them, but there's no, nothing to show for it. So the second thing is, he says you have to respond, which he sometimes calls it responsibility, which is to say that, you know, you have to listen and respond and interact and all those types of things. The third thing is that you have to respect them. And because if you just care and respond to them without respecting them, then again, it's sort of this, it's not quite a full love. And then of course, if you're gonna respect them, that leads to the fourth thing, you have to know them. Because you can't just fake respect, you actually have to know them and respect them for, for all that they are. And so those four things, care, respond, respect, and know. If you do all four of those things and continually practice those things, so you're constantly getting to know your students better, you're constantly responding to them, you're creating a sense of mutual respect, and you care about them, if you do those four things, the technology just sort of flows naturally. You, you have a natural sense of what technologies are appropriate, when they're appropriate, and, and why. Uh, so that doesn't, maybe it's not the formulaic answer people might want, but that's, to me, the closest thing to the truth. There's a couple of different ways to think about this question. Um, one is, we, I think we should all be aware that we all have very deep and complex relationships with technology. And part of the problem is that we often define technology as everything that's been invented in the last five years or maybe everything that's been invented in our lifetimes or something like that. Whereas in reality, like, there are multiple technologies that affect our lives every day. And I mentioned the car earlier as a very, as one that dramatically affects our lives every day. And people don't think much about it. And yet, um, you know, if we talk about disconnection, people complain about texting and that kind of thing. The car is probably <laughs> equally, if not more, um, culpable for that disconnection that we uh, see today in our communities. 
Um, so I think everybody should be aware that they have a relationship to technology and that they should, they should critically assess that relationship. Um, the second thing is that in, through assessing our relationship with technology, I think what I found is that I realized that I needed to embrace might not be the right word. Not, it's not like you're embracing technology. It's that you're using technology so that it doesn't use you. <laughs> and what I mean by that is that I use many technologies on a daily basis that I'm very skeptical of, of their use and and I, I worry about how they might be changing our society. But I actually, because of that, I use the technologies all the more so that I become very sophisticated about their use and I understand these, uh, these different pitfalls of using different technologies. And because of that, then I can come into the classroom and, and hopefully guide students better and, and, and help them think more about technology more deeply. Um, in terms of just getting started, uh, I think the best way to get started is to start with something you're very passionate about. And that may be slightly off, it might be even outside of your job. For example, you might be really interested in, uh, I don't know, some hobby or something, right? Like model airplanes. So go ahead and, and go online and try to find what would be the best way to learn more about model airplanes. And what you'll discover is that not only are there sort of the, there's the books, of course, and then there's the websites, but then you'll very soon you'll discover blogs and you'll discover people who tweet about it all the time. And what you'll find is that the, the really rich and best stuff is often percolating on the blogs, like in this new media sphere, not in the books. And the books are sort of, you know, coming later. And so if you want to be on the cutting edge, you have to go to these blogs and to, to Twitter and so on. I think having that eye-opening experience, that revelation that, wow, there's really good stuff here. There's a good community here. That's, I think that's the key, is that people often think of this as simple information. And to the extent that it's information, it's, uh, it can seem like an over, overload, information overload. But if instead you realize it's a community, that, that this is a community of people sharing information and sharing ideas, then it becomes very, something very different. And so whatever you're passionate about, try to find the community online that's sharing these ideas. And I think then you'll start to get an insight into how these technologies can actually uh, be useful within this new media environment.